Roberts and Jenis live this time for October 5th in the year 2022, the year of our Lord. So happy to have you with us tonight. As you know, this program is set aside for you to ask your questions, give your comments on any topic whatsoever. And as my role as host of this program, I will endeavor to answer your questions to the best of my ability using our Catholic faith, tradition, the scripture, the popes, the councils, the saints, the doctors, the catechisms, <clears throat> and just about anything I can find to help you walk away satisfied that your question has indeed been answered. We come to you every Wednesday from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. And at the top of the program, sometimes I have topics that I want to cover before we get to our questions. And tonight is indeed a special night because as I told you last week, we have as our special guest, Dr. E. Michael Jones, who has just written a book called The Dangers of Beauty, an ominous title. And he's going to explain to us what that all means as we get into our program. And uh, before we get into his book and all that, we're going to have him come up to the studio here and get on our screen and we'll welcome him. And uh, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for coming tonight. So glad to have you with us. Thank you, Bob. It's good to be here. Good to see you again. You too. You are one busy man. I've known Michael Jones for what, Mike, about 20 years now, I think. Yeah. 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 We were together and, uh, in Russia. We went to Russia together, 2007. Man, that seems like it was yesterday, and <laughs> that, it's almost 20 years ago. It's amazing. And um, you haven't aged a bit. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I was hoping I had improved over this period of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you have, looking at you from here. It's amazing. You get some suntan out there? Uh, yeah, the I do. I do. We go to the lake. I, I row in the morning. So, yeah, it's, it's been a great summer. Yeah, that's one thing I admire about you. You keep in shape. So you'll be around for a while, hopefully, unless something catastrophic comes into your life. Right. But um, so happy to have you here. And, and, and we could have you on uh, probably, you know, maybe once every two months or so to uh, go over the many books that you've written that have this, just been phenomenal for people of the Catholic faith. There is nobody that I know like you, Mike, and um, I don't mean to uh, stroke your ego here, but I just say this from the truth. There's nobody I know who is able to connect the dots of human society, spiritually, mentally, physically, socially, as well as you have. And that is exhibited par excellence in your books. Um, I haven't even read half of your books, though, but the ones that I have read are... I mean, they're just in a league all their own, a league all their own. I don't know how you do it. Um, you have an excellent mind and your spiritual life is top notch. And um, that's why a lot of people listen to you and uh, read your books. So it's a privilege to have you here, sir. And um, we'll make the best of this program that we can. This book that you wrote, um, The Dangers of Beauty, um, you had asked me to write a review for it, which I did, and I enjoyed every minute of it because the book was so spectacular that um, you just don't often find people who can look beneath the surface of society like you can. And when I say society, I don't mean society in general. I mean the way society expresses itself in art, architecture, poetry, literature, music, theater, you name it, you television and fashion, uh, you can add those in there. Uh, that's the way society expresses itself. And often we can become mesmerized <clears throat> by these vehicles that society uses because they always make themselves look good or they try to, but you have this uncanny ability to get beneath the surface and show where, why, how, and when of all these, um, these, these, these um, um, demonstrations of their prowess that they give us and show us the real story. Mm -hmm. And that's what uh, I love about you. And, uh, and I know m most of your audience that I've talked to love that about you, to um, show the real story. So that's what we're going to do tonight. 
And uh, we're going to start by, not yet, in, in, in a minute or so here, but we're going to bring up pictures from your book. And there's hundreds of them in there. Um, paintings by famous artists, uh, good, bad, and ugly. Uh, we're going to bring up architecture. We're going to bring up, you know, musical issues, all kinds of things that we can jam into this two-hour period. And we're going to listen to you explain to us the uh, the inside story, the inside track of all these things that we're going to look at and show us what we're looking at because we want to know. Curious minds want to know. And you're the man. So um, I have John, my producer, is going to bring up one picture at a time from your book. And that should be enough for you to be prompted to just tell us what that story is all about in that picture. And sometimes they're going to be people. Sometimes they're going to be paintings. Um, and because behind every painting, there's a person. And that person has a personality. And that person uh, is either good, bad, or somewhere in between. And we need to know that as well, because that's going to be expressed in his art, as you well have told us. So uh, that's what we're going to ask you to do tonight. So John, my producer, is going to bring up our first picture tonight. Well, that's the one I chose for, for the... For the <laughs> um, let's go to the next picture, John. All right. This is the first picture in your book, Mike. And uh, tell us who this is and what he's trying to demonstrate here. Well, this is a concert, uh, a rap artist whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, and at this concert, uh, a number of people died. They were trampled to death. Uh, and whenever something like this happens, there's always time, some type of attempt to explain what's going on. Uh, and it invariably uh, ignores the most obvious thing that is going on at a concert, which is namely the mu music. What, what you have here is uh, deranged music uh, appealing to deranged souls that leads to violence. It's that simple. There were uh, stories in the newspaper of rappers in Atlanta who invariably were, ended up shooting each other. Again, this well, was it COVID? Was it unemployment? No, it's the music. And if we go to people like uh, Plato, he had a clear understanding that music is something that goes directly to the soul, bypassing uh, the mind along the way and creates uh, emotions uh, or, or uh, cultivates the, the, uh, the, the, the direction of emotions. And so art, to get to the heart of the matter, art is always mimesis. Mimesis is imitation of nature. That's all it's going to be. That's all it's ever going to be. It's easier to understand if we had started with the, the uh, artwork, but we'll get to that sooner or later. Uh, music is imitation of nature, and the nature we're talking about is the motions of the soul. Great. So you have, you have for, uh, you've had experiences, uh, you're out, and it's a sunny day, and the cloud, a cloud goes in front of the, the sun, and there's, it affects your soul. It's suddenly, it's a different outlook on life. It's a different sure. way of viewing it. Same, the reverse is the same thing. You can be down, you can be symbolized by a cloudy sky, and suddenly the sun comes out and you feel better. This is the soul, the motions of the soul that music can imitate uh, directly. Now, if you have too much agitation, the soul is going to get agitated and it's going to seek some type of outlet. And more often than not, it will be violence. And so you have the phenomena of violence at these concerts. Uh, the man who understood this best at that time was uh, Euripides, and he wrote uh, the play called The Bacchae, which is about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, except that it was more wine, and it wasn't. It was uh, music that uh, to, uh, modes of music that are inappropriate that arouse the emotions to an un. Uh, an unprecedented, unseemly, and unproductive way that leads to agitation and violence. Aristotle right. uh, wrote about this in the poetics. Most people think the poetics is just about drama. It's also about music because music and drama were one and the same thing at that point. Uh, we don't hear the music anymore. We just read the play. But there is uh, what you do uh, in the musical, uh, if you're imitating nature, is you arouse the passions, you get people uh, in some type of interest in some type of story, and then you resolve that 
arousal. And when you resolve it, you get a sense of peace. And he called that catharsis. And he was, his, his father was a doctor and he considered that a, a medical term. If you, don't, if you don't resolve it in the way going like from a seventh chord to the, to the, 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 the chord you began with, you're going to feel unsatisfied and that dissatisfaction can lead to uh, unexpected results and violence. And that's exactly what happens with the Bacchae where Pentheus, when the women go to uh, Dionysus arrives in town, the women dance naked on the mountainside uh, Dionysus is captured, and then he says, wouldn't you like to see the women dance naked? And Pentheus, of course, wants to see the women dance naked, but he has to put on a dress. He goes there, the women see him, Dionysus says, climb a tree, you get a better view. Climbs a tree, the women take him down, tear him limb from limb. Mm. Wow. That's, well, that's the danger, that's the danger to society that you can uh, encounter when you release uh, 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 emotion from tonal control, when you release sexuality from moral control, uh, these are the th bad things that happen. And the Greeks understood it uh, very well back uh, hundreds of years before Christ. What about African drums? Uh, you know, the, how they used to incite themselves into ecstasy or to violence or to, you know, killing uh, by playing the drums. Uh, would that fit into the same category? Yeah, well, it's, there are martial modes. There, you can play modes that will get you psyched up and ready to march into war. Uh, the, I, I knew uh, Father uh, Robert Scaris, who was the head of the Instituto Pontificio di Musica Sacra in Rome, and he was responsible for music all over the world. And that posed problems because if you go to one of the best pieces on music ever written, which was uh, the Motu Proprio by Pius X, he says the drums are completely inappropriate for liturgical music, completely inappropriate. Anytime the, the lower part of your body starts swinging around rhythmically, uh, you're not raising the mind and heart to God. So the classic example that I saw, I was at Steubenville and the, there's this charismatic lady and she's shaking her butt because the music lent itself to shaking your butt. Yeah. Because it did that, it's not appropriate for uh, liturgical use, even though there's nothing wrong with dancing. Yeah. You know, this uh, picture here, and by the way, it's Travis Scott. If that oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank yeah. you for bringing that to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it looks like he's in hell with all the fire around him. And maybe that's what they want. They want to portray, you know, this is, this is your future world, <laughs> you know? And well, th there are lots of demonic tropes throughout popular music. Mm -hmm. It was it started earlier with uh, Ozzy Osbourne and those people, but uh, the, this, the rap uh, was hadn't evolved at that point. But it has uh, adopted uh, these type of satanic or demonic tropes as well. Yeah, yeah, you see them all over the place with rap music. Uh, I, I, it's it amazes me how rap music had become so popular in the last what ten years or so. Well, I, I was, uh, Plato said, if your soul is disordered, you'll want disordered music. I think yeah. that's what we're talking about. You've got a lot of disordered souls out there because of the way the culture uh, inflames appetite. And so they like disorder in the music because it corresponds to the disorder in their souls. I think that's what we're, what we're seeing here. Yeah, you're right. Okay, next picture, uh, John. You touched on this a little bit, Mike. Um, uh, is there anything more you want to say about uh, this is, Pythagoras? Uh, we're, we're talking about, uh, yeah, this is Pythagoras. One of the people who uh, uh, promoted Pythagoras was Plato. And what we're talking about here is an understanding of uh, the first understanding of the universe as something other than simply material things. And that was numbers and ratio. And that's what Pythagoras was famous for. Uh, Plato uh, uh, appropriated this idea. So I'll, I'll talk about Plato now because uh, it's the same thing. We have uh, uh, what were the fundamental issue here that we cover in the book is the difference between uh, the world before Christ and the world after Christ. It's obviously a turning point in human history. And before Christ, you had the Platonic worldview, and P Pythagoras was part of it, where basically you had the world, the realm of forms 
which was eternal figures like the triangle, uh, the circle, those type of things. And then you had the world uh, that we live in in time. That was eternal. And this is the world of flux, which has no meaning whatsoever. You can't, it, there's no way to talk about it. Uh, it's just meaningless change. And so art then becomes uh, basically the imposition of these forms onto matter. Uh, in, in this instance, the stone, stone, we'll say. So you carve a, a pillar, you know, it's like a circle a pillar, and then you carve a rectangle, you put that on top of the pillar, and then you have a triangle on top of that, and then you've got a temple. And that is basically art in a world that no one knew was created. Now, neither Plato nor Aristotle understood that the world had been created. And that was the big change that took place. It wasn't so much, art is always going to be imitation of nature, but what changed over this period of time is their understanding of nature, going from that, what I just described, to the Christian the understanding is that in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, which rendered nature, it's no longer meaningless flux. It never was. I mean, they understood that. Uh, they couldn't articulate it, but they understood it in some way or other. Uh, now there is a logos uh, to nature. And the whole point of the artist, the artist is now uh, empowered to do things that he never did before. Yeah, great. Good explanation. All right, next picture, John. <clears throat> All right, these are the uh, cave paintings in Altamira, uh, Spain. Now, this happened, I believe, in 1878. I believe there's a Spanish nobleman. He's examining his property. There's a cave there. He's looking at the floor, kind of makes sense of the detritus and the floor. And his daughter wanders farther into the cave. Cave's about a kilometer long. And suddenly she looks up and she sees these drawings. And she's stunned and doesn't know what this, what, what is this? Who did this? And they, he wrote a, a, a description of it, a scholarly description. And he said that these were artists who did this uh, 30,000 years ago. And immediately the French uh, attacked them and said, nobody, nobody who lived 30,000 years ago uh, could have done this. They were cavemen. Uh, and at that point, uh, the whole idea of the caveman entered history. H.G. Wells then wrote his History of the World with all kinds of speculation about uh, what was the sex life of a caveman and what did he drink for breakfast and so on and so forth. And it was E.K. Testerton who stepped in at this point, and he said uh, in the book of The Everlasting Man, he said, the only thing we know about the caveman is what he did in the cave, and the caveman was an artist. And that is something that is irreducible, irreducible because you're talking about a man, a human being, that no, there's, no other, there's no thing like that in nature. So Testerton said, uh, the the reindeer man could portray the reindeer, but the reindeer couldn't. Mm -hmm. And he started talking about art as a mirror, which is his idea of talking about art as imitation. But you, you some, there's something irreducible here about the nature of man, which becomes more apparent, I think, if we talk about the nature of language. There's the, the English thought was basically wrecked by evolution. It was wrecked by this, uh, which became the explanation of everything. And that meant that everything evolved, including man. And uh, that meant that language evolved. Well, language cannot evolve. It cannot evolve. There's a certain point where the man will speak to one other person. Let's say it's a woman. And the man is going to say, hi, how are you? And the woman is going to say, fine, how are you? Now, how could that evolve separately? Language is complete right there from the beginning. Ratzinger, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger talked about it with regard to Adam, the first man, saying that the first word he spoke was probably to God because there's no one else to speak to. And then after that point, he, uh, when God created woman, he would say something like what I just said. There's no other explanation. And so there's this irreducible nature of man that finds expression in language, and art. So we, we're talking about two of the three transcendentals, which are the characteristics of being. The good, which is we, we achieve through action. The true, which we achieve through uh, philosophy, through under discourse of reason. And beauty, the beautiful, which we achieve 
through the imitation of nature. And yeah. those are the, they're interchangeable and one will uh, facilitate the other. Keith yeah. said, truth is beauty and beauty truth. That was one take on what I just tried to say. Yeah, it's so true that what you're saying, because this separates man from everything else in nature, because man has a sense of beauty. He has a sense of death. He communicates. He loves art. He, he gets fearful of the afterlife. I mean, all these things that men have are natural. You don't develop them, as you said. You don't evolve into these things. These are there. And this is what makes man, man. And we That's see right. this in, in this uh, artist uh, work here on the cave wall. I mean, if that doesn't tell you something, this is, this is, this is why they tried to, uh, to, um, to uh, you know, make it like it was nothing. You know, make it like it was, uh, it couldn't have been a, a caveman who did this. Because they can't, they can't fathom that what we are today, we were thousands of years ago. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, absolutely years. right. There is something irreducibly human about this. One aspect is manifestation is language, and the other is the art, which is imitation of nature. No animal can do this. Right. Okay, next picture, John. One of your favorite people. Rick Rubin, creator of rap music. It was always a, a Jewish black collaboration. Uh, he created the mayhem. Uh, it, it, I think the, the less we say about Rick Rubin, the better off we'll be. <laughs> Let's move on to the next picture. Yeah, uh, let me just preface this by saying this is the introduction to your book in which you're trying to give sort of a panoramic view of what you're going to be covering. And that's why these pictures seem so disjointed. Right. And I, I hesitated to do this, but I figured maybe you want, if you want to go through them faster, that's fine. So, do you want this to is, talk this, to so uh, Rick Rubin uh, invented rap music. In his, he didn't invent it. It was already happening in places like the Bronx. He he took it, you know, he's, he's a Jewish entrepreneur, cultural entrepreneur. He took it and he took it, made it marketable. That's pretty much what Jews do. They don't invent yeah. things. They, they yeah. market them. Yeah, uh, and he did it when he was a student at NYU. And the next picture is uh, one of the plays that was being put on at NYU. It was Dionysus in '69 by a professor named Schechner, and this was the beginning of the sexual revolution. And uh, this was basically his rendering of the Bacchae as uh, something. Uh, what should I say? A happy occasion? No, it's not going to be happy because the insight that Dionysus, I'm sorry, that uh, Euripides had was that if you let passion get out of control, someone's going to die. Well, yeah. that's true. That is what happened. And that's yeah. what happened over that period of time. And this picture, just like the one with uh, Travis Scott, to me is a picture of what these people are going to face in hell. Because, look, if you want to go after, you know, your, your sex all your life and live by sex and that's all there is to life, well, that's what you're going to get. And this, this to me, is a scene of hell right here. And uh, I just can't help but uh, feel that way when I look at pictures like this. Yeah, it's well, it, it was hell. There was no question about it. It was hell. And it, it resulted in uh, the horror genre. But that's another book. It's, I wrote that called Monsters from the Id. By the, yeah. end, by the end of the 70s, everybody was knew that sex could kill you, which was the message yeah. of the pocket. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, you'll have to excuse me. You'll see those uh, very those highlights in each picture. That's because I took these pictures with my uh, my cell phone camera, and um, somehow these uh, it, it couldn't filter out the uh, the highlights here. So that's what you're seeing when you look at the pictures there. All right, next picture, John. Again, this is your introduction, Mike. So I'm just going to let you. you know, <laughs> <with it. laughs> this is a scene from Casablanca. Why did I say I? You know, you've got me stumped here. Why did? Why is this picture in my book? <laughs> Let's go to the next picture. Okay. Yeah. Well, you actually didn't explain it. You just made one sentence reference to that picture, and I think maybe it was important to you. I don't know. But yeah. this one is important by Giada. So go ahead with this. Yeah. One. Now, this is very important because this is the turning point in human history. Tell us so, what year we're looking at here, Mike. We're talking about the uh, the uh, early 1300s around then. So yeah. Giotto was about one generation younger than uh, Thomas Aquinas, who died at the age of 49, died in a very, uh, he just worked himself to death. Mm -hmm. uh, Never wrote a book on aesthetics, but he did write a very interesting book on being, and that was had 
he articulated a revolutionary change that I have already indicated from the earlier understanding of Plato. Aquinas studied Aristotle. Aristotle was heading in that direction when he talked about entelechy, because Aristotle would say to Plato, where, where, where are those forms? Where are they? Point yeah. them out to me. Is, it, yeah. is, they, is there a form for a bed? <laughs> is there a form for a pillow for yeah. the bed? You know what I mean? It's, it, and uh, Aristotle said, the form is in the thing itself. Now, that was a big step in the direction. And then Aquinas drew the ontological conclusion to this and said, basically, existence calls essence into being. Now, that's the exact opposite of what I said with Plato. Plato is... Uh, essence imposes order on existence, which is totally chaotic. That's not the world, uh, the redeemed world, the incarnational world of Christianity. Yeah. And I don't know whether Giotto read Aquinas. He apparently did a portrait of him. I don't, because what happened with Aquinas is he was forgotten. <laughs> he was replaced by William of Ockham, who had a terrible influence on philosophy uh, philosophy descended into basically Islam, a form of Islam. And the best manifestation of that was Martin Luther uh, and his uh, voluntarism and nominalism led to that uh, direction. So what the, one of the points of this book is that oftentimes the artist can portray what the philosopher cannot explain. And that was Giotto. So if you have, if you take Vasari, Vasari is the chronicler of the art, this stupendous development of art in Italy during this period of time. Vasari says that Giotto broke with Greek models. Now, the Greek model I think he had in mind was the icon. And the icon, it's pretty formal. It's, for, you know, pretty standardized. There's a full face vision of one person saint or Christ or whatever. And then there's a gold background and then maybe be a halo on top of that. Yeah. And that's pretty much a little bit of writing. Well, that's good as it goes, but uh, what it's, it lacks drama. Yeah. There's no drama there. Yeah. And so what, what Giorgio did was break that back, break that background as if to, you know, he kind of ripped it apart and suddenly you're outside and, Oh, wait a minute. There's a whole landscape behind behind us there and not only that you're adding people to the thing and now you've got you're adding drama yeah i, I, I just gave this uh, talk to a, a group of uh, orthodox young people and at this point i you know i said look was this was this worth the risk what do you think because the you, the orthodox did not go down this road hmm. the orthodox went from being the cutting edge of logos in human history when the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity was hammered out in Greek in those councils to a point where it kind of ossified and it lost that dynamism for one reason or another uh, over the next thousand years. And the, the Logos, the development of Logos jumped to the West and yeah. it jumped to art. It jumped to art because as I said, Occam is not uh, the cutting edge of Logos. Yeah. It's a retreat, it's an abandonment. Nominalism is a disaster for the development of philosophy. He was the dominant guy. Aquinas was all but forgotten at this point. And it was the artists who carried this forward. Yeah. This is, a, there are, I, I have a, in the book, I have a picture of the Arena Chapel. Uh, just to give you some of, a, a, idea of the architectural unity of that color blue that kind of unites all these things. Mm -hmm. But there are portraits, let's say, of the, uh, so there are, you know, various uh, paintings of various incidents in the gospel. You have the uh, Christ asleep in the boat passage. And now, first of all, that's a dynamic, uh, dramatic passage to begin with. I mean, the storm, everybody's upset. And suddenly now Giotto can portray the storm. He can portray the expression on the man's face. Yeah. And you've yeah. got a new, this is my Mises is taken to a, a, an unprecedented level. Yeah. That yeah. was the great breakthrough. And that got the ball rolling for one of the greatest developments of art in human history. This is why uh, even today in the Eastern Orthodox artistry, it's all, you know, Romanesque, you know, with the faces like you were describing, you know, expressionless faces. And that's it. That's all they have in, in their artistry, in their religious artistry, as opposed to Giotto here, where you can even see the expression on the angels' faces and everybody's face here. Everything is filled with emotion. 
and and feeling and 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 beauty. It's just absolutely amazing the stark contrast you have here with the thousand years prior. You know <laughs> what a, what a genius this guy was. He was. He broke genius first of all because he broke the mold because he broke with Greek models. Yeah. He broke. This was the beginning of the. Uh, uh, saying that Plato is not the best explanation, but no one could come up with this. Yeah. No, this, it, this is one of the big shocks I had in writing this book was to realize that even up to the 20th century, even people who are Thomists, uh, maybe we should get into this later, but Etienne Gilson, he's not a Thomist. He's a Platonist when it comes to his ascetics. Yeah, I remember, I remember reading that in your book. Yeah. Would you say that the return to nominalism after Aquinas was basically a return to Platonism? Um, I'd have to think about that. Okay. I mean, the thing, the thing that, no, no, because a Plato, Plato could, no, it's way beyond Plato. If you're talking about, if you're, you're talking about the mind of God, that's, Plato could never. It's something. It's a, an idea that was so alien to Plato he couldn't even talk about. It. So I don't think. No, I wouldn't talk about this as a return to Platonism. No. Okay. All right. Next picture, John. Wow, one right. of your favorites, Mike. Yeah, this is a, a cute <laughs> chick from the year thirty thousand BC. It's known as the Willemdorf uh, Venus. Uh, it was discovered in Austria, uh, and. Uh, it is mimesis. There's no question about it. And I'm trying. I'm pointing out here that mimesis is not necessarily a photographic uh, reproduction. Yeah. Uh, because uh, those people were hunter-gatherers, as far as I know. Uh, hunter-gatherers do not get fat. They, uh, <laughs> I said in the book, the best example is uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy, which is about hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari. You're not going to get fat with a, being that type of existence. But what, what is the important? So this is a, a man, I'm assuming. This is Venus. It's, it's a fertility goddess. And what's important? Well, what's important to a man? Well, big breasts, you know, the whole <laughs> naked body, uh, because they are symbols of fertility. And this gets to the essence of a man's understanding of woman, the kind of the mystery of the woman, that she can, uh, life comes forth from the woman. Uh, the genitalia are per portrayed fairly realistically, and the woman has the ability to nurture life, and that's why they have those big breasts there. And this is important because this is how the human race moves forward. Now, what this lady does not have is a face. And what I think that means here is uh, there's a lot of things you could say about that, but what it means, I think, is that uh, we're back to uh, the understanding of sexuality that uh, Euripides was talking about in the Bacca. It's a force. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful force that you worship, and it takes over at a certain point, and you just succumb to this spell. And uh, is there is that another human being that could be uh, valued because of the thought that comes forth? No, that's not what we're talking about here. We don't have that idea of, of uh, human nature. We don't have that idea of femininity yet because we're still immersed in the consequences of the fall. Uh, the consequences of original sin, and we're we're but but we're still human beings, even in this wounded kind of devastated state, and we're moving out of that uh, state slowly by making these types of artifacts and and imitating nature. Yeah. Okay. Next picture, John. <clears throat> now this is a progression along. This is the myth of Am Amor and Psyche. And the whole point of Amor and Psyche is that uh, sex takes place in the dark and it's this primeval force and there's no consciousness to it. And we know that there's something, this is the result of the fall. Uh, we have lost the sense of uh, a, a communion of persons here. It's a biological drive and you worship the biological drive through figures like uh, Venus, uh, these uh, fertility goddesses. This is a story about uh, the consciousness arriving in the fem feminine psyche. Suke, it's Amor and Suke. It's a tale by Apuleius. Uh, Amor is love or uh, Dionysus or whatever god of love, the male god of love. Uh, and Suke is the soul. So we're talking about the development of the soul or consciousness. And so this is a story about how the god wants to have sex in the dark. 
and the god just wants to visit at night. You know, he's kind of like a, a, a deadbeat dad in, in the ghetto. And, and it's that type of primal force. And the woman is le- uh, reduced to this level of being used in the dark. And uh, Psuke, as the feminine consciousness, is not happy with this. And so she wants to see who she's screwing. And so she brings candle, a light to the thing. Now, this is enlightenment. We're talking about the enlightenment that is taking place of human consciousness. And uh, uh, Amor, at that point, is scandalized, and he flies away. And the rest of the story is basically taming Amor by bringing consciousness to it. That's what this story is about. Mike, let me ask you this question. Um, Okay, now we're in your second we, in your first chapter, as you see above there, it says painting in Italy. So we're going to have a whole series of paintings from Italian artists. Um, when you just describe this, you know, the lady brings the light so she can see who she's screwing and all this kind of stuff. Are you telling us that these artists are thinking this through philosophically as they're painting? Or they just paint and somehow we grasp out of this the milieu of their philosophical culture and we can express it in our terms. No, this is an illustration. This is not some art. This is not what, what, like what we just saw. The story is already there. Uh, the, the artist has been given the story. He's just illustrating a story. Okay, great. All right, next picture. And that's a, another, this is a late uh, 19th century version of the same story. Uh, uh, but uh, much more realistic here. And the female body there is really, uh, what should I say? It's really attractive. And we're heading in that direction again, because at this point, at this point, you're getting so realistic that uh, you're running the danger of arousing carnal passion. And if you're familiar with the development of French uh, art during this period of time, which I discussed uh, other in the book, you can understand how it ended up this way. Yeah. This was considered an anachronism at this time because at the time they're reaching this this real advancement in terms of uh, mimesis. The avant-garde had turned away from that and was doing uh, impressionism at this point. Okay, so would you say that this picture is the time where your title actually comes into play? where you say the dangers of beauty. Well, when I look at this, I see dangers of beauty. It's so voluptuous yeah, it is. that you've reached a turning point. Yeah, the, the turning point in France came earlier, right around the time of, of the uh, French Revolution. Uh, the French had a, uh, the French uh, basically, look, in order, to, in order to learn art, you had to go to Italy. It's that simple. Uh, Rubens went, all the Germans, the Dutch went, and the French were not like that. They decided we're going to do it on our own. And so France, the art in France took on a different trajectory that brought it much closer, I think, to the dangers that we're talking about. So, yeah, you're right. This is there, this is a dangerous painting. Okay. Next picture. Again, sorry about the highlight there, but um, this is uh, your friend, uh, Boethius. Do um, you want to tell us why you put him in there at this time? That's or? a good question. I'm trying to wonder why, why. Boethius was not a painter. He wrote The Consolation of Philosophy. Uh, oh, this is a painting of Boethius receiving The Consolation of Philosophy. Okay, yeah, that's great. So uh, what would, what was, this is, there should be something, a, a crucial thing that we should have discussed in order to understand what's going on here is that illustration of Le, Le Très Riche or the Duc de Berry. Yeah, I didn't put that in your the sequence here, so I'm sorry about that, that. That's that's really important because what you have there is uh, you've got form. Uh, it, it's a very complicated piece of painting because it's done with compass. There are all kinds of geometrical relationships there. And then you have content, which is the story of Adam and Eve, and they don't come together. Mm. So you got one thing that's kind of like a circle going around, and it's all this kind of random story being appended. Uh, and that's that was before Boethius. Uh, I'm sorry, before uh, Giotto. Al, you look. You've got you've got geometrical ratios here. There's the golden, the golden ratio right there, separating the two parts of the painting. Yeah. Uh, you've got all of these forms. It's it. We're heading toward a a more perfect unification of. Uh, geometry in life, 
because that's the that's the essence of what a great art is going to be something that looks orderly but real yeah so you can have order you can have order like geometric patterns and that's known as geometry or you can look out the window and that's undeniably real but it's not organized but when you put both of those things together that's beauty that's maximal beautiful. essence maximal existence yeah yeah i think we get to that in one of your other pictures here by the way do you need to take a water break here at all we've been gone no i'm fine time. i'm fine. fine okay yeah. next picture now this is this is um uh Lippi this is probably Lippi. this is another example of uh my mesis uh that became uh, distracting because this is his mistress being portrayed as the blessed mother. Yeah. I didn't, so you, I didn't. go ahead. You, you have, you have associations here that are, well, I mean, we don't know who this lady was. It's, it was his mistress. We don't know, but everybody in Florence at the time knew it, uh, who it was. And yeah. to put her face on the blessed mother was kind of shocking uh, <laughs> and a kind of distraction. And I think this little guy down here is telling you that he got the joke. Because <laughs> he's looking at you and like, isn't this guy clever putting a, a whore's face on the Blessed Mother? So yeah. you have this kind of level of consciousness that's going on here uh, that the Italians can understand. Uh, and, and they're reaching a, a sense of confidence with organizing the material that allows them to delve into uh, psychology or, or joking with you or, or that type of thing. But you see, there's the... the the nature in the background, uh, you've got the forms and it's coalescing into, uh, you know, it's, it's organized and it's alive at the same time. So this yeah. is, we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. Some, uh, other, um, analyzers of this would call it a break between grace and nature where you have, you know, the grace side winning the war up until this point. And then these Italian authors started feeling their oats, so to speak, and now allowing nature to, more or less win the battle and you can tell that by the fact that this is not the blessed virgin this is a whore yeah. and you know that says it all itself all right next i think i put one in here to uh, coordinate with what you had done and i'm the one to put the notes up there this is um Fouquet, uh painting a madonna with the breast exposed the first time right. this has actually appeared and again show you how nature is overtaking grace and um, the Renaissance feels it has a license to do so because, wow, uh, we're, we're big boys now. You know, we've we've gotten over the the uh, elementary elements of of society. And now we're we're ruling the world here. And this is an expression of this because we can make the Madonna into a, a whore, basically. And uh, so there we have it. Next picture. <clears throat> All right, now this is this is a crucial turning point now uh, from what I described with the, the uh, illustration, uh, illustrated manuscript where you have uh, geometry and you've got a, a story, uh, the Genesis story, and they, they don't come together. There is no unifying principle there. Now, this is the exact opposite. This is Della Francesco's uh, John the Baptist, the baptism of Christ. And the illustrations are put in here so what you're seeing here now is you don't see this uh, when you look at the picture. Obviously, those red lines are not there. This is something an, an analytic tool has been added later on. But you understand now how the how effectively the geometry has been integrated into a biblical story. Complete. This is a, a real triumph here uh, of those two principles that are extraneous and always struggling to to to. Uh, always, in some sense, in conflict with each other. Plato could have never uh, understood this. Uh, he would uh, look at the picture. Uh, without the red drawings, you have the golden ratio with the tree there. There are the apostles. There's Christ. But then you have that oval. And now what you see here is a dramatic presentation uh, of Christ's humanity and his divinity at the same time. So you so have this... Are you telling us that the artist here had a consciousness of these geometric proportions at the same time he had the oval to soften it up and give us another aspect of life? 
This was in his mind when he was doing this. Are you saying that to us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. These they, they 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 trained. I mean, this is an early example where they're finally getting it of how do I integrate geometry into life? Uh, is, uh, and they're finally getting it's finally now coming together. This we have to remember this is a transgenerational uh process that's taking place over centuries. Centuries of the the the, the best people you have in Italy devoting their best efforts to uh, advancing, moving my Mises forward here. Now, and, did this kind of philosophy that these artists knew about and portrayed on their canvas affect society in general? And if it did, in what way could you give us an example of that? Yeah, I mean, does beauty affect the society? Do you live, live uh, do you live in a world that is beautiful? I don't. I mean, there's some parts of it that are beautiful. Aquinas said uh, m a man needs... Uh, delight or pleasure if he's not going to get it in spiritual things he's going to seek it in things that are sensual and that so the ugliness of society and the prevalence of pornography go hand in hand gotcha. they just go hand in hand because you live in an ugly world a meaningless world and the only thing that makes sense to you is the uh, naked woman's naked body because it's obviously something beautiful and then that gets twisted in, into pornography yeah. This is this is something. Uh, 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 they we're heading. That's heading downward. That's the downward trajectory that we're in right now. Yeah. But this is the upward trajectory where it's all starting to come together, and so you have uh, basically the the circle, which is the symbol of God's unity, and in a sense the symbol of God the Father. He's not portrayed in this uh, painting, and then you have the triangle. Yeah, which which are the the. The images that Plato felt existed in that realm of form. We're not ignoring that. We're not turning our back on Plato or Pythagoras or their understanding of this. We're bringing. We're moving it forward. You're integrating. We're, we're, we're integrating it into our understanding of Christianity and our understanding of life. Yeah. And so you okay. have the, the the triangle here. Uh, there's the base of the triangle. The apex of the triangle is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Who is hovering over Christ. Uh, he is also the center of the circle, yeah. which is the symbol of God, God, God's unity. So we have the Trinity and the unity and, and symbolized by a circle and a triangle. But then you have Christ underneath it and the vertical line that bisects both God, uh, God the Father unseen at the top, going down through God the Holy Spirit, goes down through Christ's face, goes through his navel. Yeah. Okay, the navel is the symbol of his humanity, and that's where the circle and and the vertical line that bisects the triangle, that's where they come together. Wow. Is there any significance to the fact that um, the line goes down through Christ's right foot instead of the middle? Or? If there is, you, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, okay. because, uh, I, I think it, 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 it corresponds in some, to some extent with the golden ratio, which okay. is not perfectly uh, symmetrical. All right. How about the tree there? Because it's so humongous. Does that have any significance at all? It helps frame the frame the the, the, the portrait. In a, it frames it in a in a natural way, in the same way that the circle and the triangle frame it in a in a geometrical way. Gotcha. Okay. Next picture. Okay. Now we go to Raphael, who uh, understood all this type of stuff. So. There's a triangle here. You can see the triangle with these hands. It's pointing up to Christ. This is the transfiguration, which is also important because uh, of uh, later developments. But we, you have uh, in, in Raphael, it's, it's understood now. He did it in a kind of workmanlike fashion. Uh, that is, is satisfying. It's satisfying. It, it, it's sometimes... Raphael becomes uh, too predictable, but this this shows the, the confidence that they've reached the point where we understand how to compose a picture. The classic uh, idea of Italian art was drama, and they had these tableau, basically a tableau of dramatic figures uh, using the same geometrical principles, but in a way that becomes uh, almost invisible. You, see, you feel the dynamism of the portrait. You feel Christ rising up there. You know that there's a kind of triangle and triangular motion there. 
but that's geometry is not the important part here. The important part is the is the emotion, uh, the 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 drama, and the exposition of the of the gospel. Yeah, this is almost like um, baroque art in the sense that its whole purpose was to bring out emotion to fight the Protestant yeah. Reformation. You know, right, right. You it's have like, the circle. You have the circle right there. You have the triangle as well. You have all the symbolism that goes like that. I think you look at this and you sense it, and you sense a kind of order and a kind of unity to this that uh, you don't have to articulate. You just yeah. you 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 perceive it. You look at it when you're in the presence of beauty. You don't come up with explanations. You just stand there and you're transfixed. Yeah. And you don't you don't want to move. The little boy there at the lower right hand corner held by his father in the green shirt. Yeah. That, that's the demoniac that Jesus cured. And yeah. He's a witness to this. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a nice touch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next picture. All right. There he is in a stark glory. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. One, one of the most stunning pieces of sculpture in human history. Again, we're seeing more and more advances in terms of uh, mimesis, this time in stone. Mm -hmm. um, the stone has a way of calming down the erotic nature of the subject matter. Uh, I mean, this is a, a male figure, so it, you know it's not erotic for normal men. Uh, and it allows you to contemplate the beauty of, of the human form, which this is. It's, it's certainly. It also, I mean, I've seen, I've seen this. When, I saw this when I was in Florence. They have a, the original is in the Uffizi, uh, but they have one outside. And it, it's to have this in a public square. What, what are we saying here? Good question. What, what are we saying here? There's <laughs> something... This is, we're heading, this is the, the high renaissance. The Medici are running uh, Florence at this point. Uh, Michelangelo's a protege. It's full of all kinds of conflict, uh, symbolized by the fate of uh, Savonarola at this time. When Savonarola, Savonarola had a, an electrifying influence on Florence, it could have saved the church, uh, but the church turned on him. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you're familiar with this feeling. You know what I mean? Of the church, tur the church <laughs> yeah. turning on you? I don't know what you're talking about, Mike. So they turned on Savonarola. Okay. Uh, sure. A lot of people think uh, in Florence consider Savonarola a saint. Uh, the main reason he's not a saint is because of the Jesuits who felt that he had attacked the Pope, or did the Pope attack him? Uh, whatever it was, uh, Savonarola was uh, hanged and then his body was burned at the stake. And uh, that was a chance to take this and put it in perspective, because the problem here is we're heading toward homosexuality. Ooh. Uh, in Florence, now I'm, I'm not saying this is a homosexual uh, sculpture. I don't think it is. But homosexuality was becoming a big problem. You have uh, the end uh, decadent cultures. They invariably gravitate towards sodomy and usury. And that's exactly where uh, Florence was going. At this time, Savonarola came and tried to bring about reform, and the Sodomites united with the usurers uh, uh, with the collaboration of the Pope, and they killed him. They killed Savonarola. And so there I can see I can see this as a just it's simply a great work of art. There's nothing homosexual about it, but right over the horizon, I'm I'm seeing trouble here. Yeah, and the trouble the trouble came with uh, with Michelangelo. He was yeah. an example of the problematic nature, uh, the direction, the problematic direction that uh, art was taking at this moment. Yeah, and we'll see that theme all the way up until the modern times where the users and the homosexuals get together and create our art and promote it for us. Um, one thing about Michelangelo here is this is such a perfect proportioned human being that when you compare that to the overstuffed um, figures that he used to paint the Sistine Chapel, you wonder if you're talking about the same artist, you know, because I'm sure you've noticed that all those overstuffed images he has in the Sistine Chapel compared to this trim and slim figure here of David, 
I think I think sculpture was his medium. I think he was much better. He did any he could do anything, but I think sculpture was. Uh, I mean, it limited him. It it it, it disciplined him, and that was his medium more yeah. so than painting. The other thing too you talk about in the book here, uh, and I don't know if it's at this point or somewhere else, but you talk about Michelangelo discovering the statue of David inside the block of marble, as opposed to somebody else saying um, that they will make the block of marble into the statue of David. You know, right. I mean, you remember that part? Yeah, I do. The, 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 I don't know if you have it here, but it's called the, die, the slave, something like the dying slave. It's a half finished sculpture where you see the slave kind of emerging from the block yeah. of marble in a very uh, graphic way. We have here again that, that that difference between the Platonic understanding mm -hmm. of art as imposing forms on a chaotic, meaningless nature, or now the Christian idea where if if God created the universe, then God is an artist and the universe is a work of art, and maybe you can find the form simply by looking at the block of marble. Maybe the block of marble is trying to tell you something. Maybe that's, this is the difference. And I see that in, in Michelangelo. Yeah, very good. Okay, next picture. Okay, this is one of my favorite artists, Titian. Uh, you got a lot to say about him in the book and um, you can take off from here. Yeah, it would be, uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, Titian comes along. Uh, the, the cover, the cover story, uh, the picture on the cover is uh, the Noli Me Tangere. Yeah, picture. we have that coming up. So save. Okay, it. so we're, we're getting we're getting a little bit out of, out of sequence here in terms of the development of Titian. Be, but Titian, by the time of Titian comes around, we know how to we know how to uh, put together a uh, we know how to structure a piece of painting. Uh, we know how to structure a work of art. Yeah, now he's, we're familiar he's, with this. I'm he's so he's so familiar, uh, basically that uh, I I've got that down. Now I'm going to get into psychological drama, and the psychological drama in Titian uh, revolves around who's looking at whom and what you're looking at. Mm. So you got uh, Adam looking at Eve, and Eve looking at the devil, and that's the whole story in a nutshell. Yep, that's sure the, that's the drama. That's the drama that's going on here. Adam, Eve should be looking at Adam. This is now we've reached a point where this is before the fall. We don't have that problem of Amor and Psyche anymore. That's that's uh, post fall, uh, where basically bodies are simply agents of some primordial power that takes over, and you go into some state of ecstasy like some type of god. What you have now is. Uh, Adam should be looking at Eve and Eve should be looking at Adam face to face. And they're going to have this communion of uh, body and soul without any interruption. Well, now it's beginning. The whole story is starting to collapse because Eve has taken her eyes off of Adam's face and he's look, she's looking at the devil and the devil is going to bring about the downfall of mankind here. Okay, next picture. All right, now this is... This goes, this is an early painting by Titian, and this is a, an early optimistic painting. Uh, again, we've got the, the golden ratio there with the tree. You've got the, all of these things that have become basic to just, it's kind of art composition 101. We know how to do this, and now we're going to, Titian is a master at this. I don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. I can concentrate on psychological drama, and here is exactly the psychological drama that we're talking about. Because you have, this is Noli Me Tangere, this is uh, Mary Magdalene meeting Christ, the risen Christ. And there's a moment of uh, t the two, two lovers wanting union, which is what people, when you fall in love, you want union with the beloved. And this is the gesture that uh, Mary Magdalene is making. She's reaching to his Christ genitals, which is would be natural for her because of her former occupation as a prostitute. She was heavily involved in that type of sexual activity. But now this is the risen Christ 
And this is the converted Mary Magdalene. And so what happens here is there's a gesture on the part of Christ where he deflects that, uh, that gesture on her part. Because that is foreclosed now, we're not going to have sexual union. Her eyes are raised and they look at the heart, not looking at the genitals. And this is a, 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 a symbol of the kind of sublimation of earthly love that can lead to divine love and then lead to eternal salvation and the contemplation of God in all eternity. And it's, op it's optimistic. It's an optimistic painting because uh, he's saying it's possible. Even given her life, even given her sexual history, she can sublimate that desire with yeah, the, the help of Christ, with good the point. grace coming from Christ and his sacraments. You can conquer that, that, that idea that sexuality is this primal force that takes control of you and can ruin your life. It's so dangerous. Yeah. Now, somebody makes a comment here in the chat room, Mike, that I think is very important uh, by a man named Anthony Puccetti. Uh, he says, and there was no philosophy of personal artistic expression until the late 18th or early 19th century with Romanticism. Before then, painters were servants of their patrons and the church, which from your from your book, I learned about Titian, uh, that he he, he would um, serve whoever gave whoever paid him, basically. Well, that, he, that's what artists do, you know. Yeah. You've got a, got a rich guy. First of all, all, rich people are the only people that commission paintings, even to this day, you know. And secondly, well, what are you going to do? And then I, I, if we continue with the Titian paintings, I'll show you uh, how he dealt with that problem. Yeah, but what do you think about this uh, Anthony statement here that there was really no philosophy behind uh, a guy like Titian? Uh, until the uh, until we come to the 18th or 19th century with romanticism. No, it's not true. It's not yeah, true. Well, what yeah, we're I seeing, what we're seeing here, did was Giotto a philosopher? No, he was an artist. So if you're saying there's no philosophy be, uh, in painting, well, yeah, you're right. It's not philosophy. It's art. But is there a, a worldview? that was created by philosophy, by somebody like Thomas Aquinas. Well, yeah, that's true. And I don't know that, 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 to how that's transmitted in a culture is a little bit mysterious. But I think that once ideas like that get out there, uh, everybody knows them. And it's not as if Aquinas is, is the guy who created the idea. All he's doing is articulating the basic principle of Christianity, yeah. which is a, a fundamental principle like uh, grace, perfects nature it doesn't destroy it yeah that I've, always understood serious it. I've always understood it where the philosophy is the beginning and then it expresses itself in art culture architecture music theater whatever and it just sort of filters its way down through society in that in those mediums and it might take 200 years for the philosophy to actually work its way down but that's where it all starts with the philosophy the painter may may or may not know that he's actually painting a philosophical idea. Um, but with guys as smart as, um, you know, Rubens, Titian, Michelangelo, you know, these guys weren't dummies. They, they no, knew what they were doing. Not at all. And, and you're talking about a high level of cultural consciousness that had grown over centuries by now, by this point. Yeah. So uh, it, it's something that becomes articulated in the very culture you live in. You live in a culture that is organized according to certain principles, and that means you understand ideas that are co congruent with those principles much better than you would uh, in another type of culture. Okay, Mike, so let's say somebody was critiquing your view of this. Not me, certainly, because I agree with you, but somebody would say, well, come on, Mike, you're reading into this painting that she's okay. doing after his genitals. You know, How do you explain right. that? That's exactly what happened. Uh, I got full of enthusiasm for this picture, and I was running around showing it to everybody. And one of the people I showed it to was a Muslim lady from, who was studying at Notre Dame, studying uh, gender studies at Notre Dame. Great combination, Islam and gender studies. And uh, she looked at it and said, you're crazy. It's not there. <laughs> so it basically came down to that I had a dirty mind. And yeah. uh, it, and that was that was the problem. Well, OK, maybe I do have a dirty mind. Uh, <laughs> most people do. Uh, but but the point here is that she was unqualified to talk about this because she had absolutely no experience dealing with this kind of art. Yeah. Because yeah. she was a Muslim. 
Right. So I, you know, I've been, she was uh, uh, from uh, Herat. She spoke Dari. So she uh, was naturally, it was, it's a dialect of Farsi. So she had that Iranian background. And I've been through uh, numerous mosques in Iran, and they are beautiful in some sense or the other, but it's not my Mises. Yeah. It's it's beautiful blue tile and this enormous, elaborate uh, tile ceilings for the inside of the mosque. The building itself, uh, for the most part, has no focus. Uh, you can walk into the mosque and you can't tell, is this the beginning? The, the, you, like the dramatic focus of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, where yeah. you look and you go straight back and there's the dove in that window, that Bernini window, uh, lead ca catching your eye and then everything else is organized in a, a, a tremendous powerful unity you don't get that sense in a mosque Be beautiful pieces so the uh the mosque of the widow of the fourth imam i think i was in that in qualman it's, it's silver it's like a silver sarcophagus and everybody's there int praying intensely with their hands on the silver but it doesn't it doesn't come together uh, as a whole and yeah. so they simply don't have they don't have that experience of sophistication. And so they're not going to see it the first time around. Yeah, and they're that, going to say, oh, it's all it's all in your mind. That, yeah, that you, was the reality. You, have, you do have to be educated to this to be able to grasp what's being shown. You know, it, it always um, uh, I, I always was alarmed at the fact that in this particular picture of Titian, um, Christ is almost naked. He's got a loincloth around him, but, you know, not much more. But Mary, she's fully clothed, and all you see are her arms. What do you think is the message behind that? Is he trying to draw us into this philosophical idea by that, or what? Well, I mean, this is the risen Christ. So uh, it, it would be a glorified, a glorified body. Uh, that's not the risen Mary Magdalene. And so... Uh, we're keep we're keeping her clothes. That's that's the way that's the way I would see it. Okay. All right. Next picture. All right. All right. Now here we go. Now we're uh, with Titian again. This is the Venus Dorbino, and here we have the exact opposite of the Venus of Willendorf. That little statue. Yeah. Uh, because this lady has a face. Hmm. And, and the, the absolutely riveting part, uh, by, by the way, uh, Mark Twain saw this. He said it was the filthiest picture he ever saw in his life. Yeah, I put that down there uh, to remind you of that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't see it that way, but it came from a different, you know, it was a different era and so on and so forth. Different culture, yeah. different era. And this is not the type of stuff that was being exhibited in, in America in well, the he, 19th He grew century. up in the Southern Baptist area. You know? Right, yeah. right. So anyway, the, the important part of this is the face uh, you got you have two options basically uh when you're looking uh, when it comes to teaching either you look at the face or you look at the genitals uh in the picture of adam and eve adam's looking at eve's face and eve is looking at the the serpent and another variation on this but the really enigmatic part of this is the look on that lady's face hmm. and this is it's like the question this is the question that we're we're asking here uh, what's it going to be is it going to be lust or is it going to be love? Hmm. That that's the that's the, the 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 expression, the question, the look on her face. Hmm. You have a uh, someone who is conscious. We have a lady with a face now, as opposed to just uh, some type of uh, uh, hair piece uh, with exaggerated genitalia. The face and the genitalia are kind of integrated into one form, one type of human form as God created it. It can go either way here. Mm -hmm. That's a, I think that's the point of the painting, the enigmatic nature of the expression on her face. It can go either way. And it, it's kind of she's kind of saying the ball's in your court. Which, what's it going to be? Gotcha. Um, I don't know if this is important. Anthony just came back and said, um, I didn't say that there was no artistic philosophy, but there but that there was no philosophy of personal artistic expression until the late 18th or 19th. Does that make any difference to you, Mike? If you're talking about the exaggerated form of the individual uh, in that famous German painting, romantic painting, the romantic individual, yeah, you're right. It, it was a, that was a function, I'd say, of the dislocation that came about because of the French Revolution and forces that were kept in, uh, social forces that kept people 
integrated were now being released and you had these rise of the individual and you had an artistic an artistic uh, credo that basically uh, said that the artist, I want to tell you about me. I want to tell you about the feelings that I'm having. These are really important feelings. And uh, I think that that's a step away in the wrong direction because okay. that's not imitation of nature. So are you that's, saying- I would say that, expressionism. Are you saying that, that Titian here is having a battle in his own mind between love and sex? Absolutely. Okay. That's, it's not in his own mind. It's the culture. The culture is, this is the cultural crisis that is starting to happen right now. So it's right, just as, as we're, when we watch TV today, we see all kinds of mayhem and drug usage and sex and blah, blah, blah. But somebody would say, hey, look, that's just what our society is. And they're just expressing that on the television, too. You know, would you say the same thing is happening in our you modern could, You can do it. Every, we have all artists have a responsibility to be honest about the time period that they live in mm -hmm. one way or the other. Or you can just be using it to exploit people's passions, which is pretty much like the, like the R-rated R-rated movie. Yeah, it's, it's first of all, it's not really serious. You're, 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 you've got obligatory sex scenes. You've got obligatory nudity scenes. You've got obligatory car chases. You've got obligatory violent gun violence. These are all tropes that get thrown, mixed and matched. A computer could do this. It's yeah. not. It's not a serious attempt to deal with the causes uh, of uh, the dislocation in our culture now. Yeah. Sometimes artists use the excuse, well, look, I'm just being an artist and I'm just portraying to you what society is like. That's my job as an artist. And somebody else would come along and say, yeah, but that's pornography. Look, art was used as an excuse to uh, introduce pornography into our society. We're getting ahead of ourselves here. This is the 20th century. This is the role that Jews played in our culture. <laughs> which was basically to mainstream. If you're talking about the 20th century, you cannot talk about art there. We're talking about without talking about Jewish influence, either okay. financial or 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 uh, prom pr promoting cultural decadence. Well, we might not have time for that tonight, but we will definitely cover that in two weeks when Mike comes back. Mike, do you need a drink of water or anything? No, no, I'm know? fine. I'm you're fine. fine. Okay. All right. Next picture. Okay. Now here we're heading. This is Titian reacting to uh, the request of his uh, uh, benefactors, his patrons. They want pornography. <laughs> They're heading in that direction. This is uh, the uh, this is I forget the Dene. It's one of the Dene portraits, and basically this is uh, from classical mythology, where uh, the god is going to take human form and inseminate that that uh, lovely looking lady. So we're heading we're heading closer. Getting closer. Look, what's she looking at? Is she looking at you? No, she's not looking at you. Is there some type of questioning, like a, a, a lady who kind of knows what the score is and wants to let you know that she knows and I got looking at you? No, she's looking in a, mo a kind of moment of sexual ecstasy, looking up to the God. And basically, we're back to Amorim Psyche, where you're having sex with gods. Mm -hmm. And when you're having sex with God, the God is not a person. It's a force. And so you're reducing sexuality to some type of primitive drive. Well, Titian's really having a hard time, isn't he? He doesn't know which way to go. Well, he's being drawn. I mean, he's, he wants to make a living. He's got to get along with rich patrons. And he's got to deal with their deranged appetites. And I think he's caught in the middle. The painting, the, uh, there's a, I, I don't know whether you've got it in here, but there's one that portrays this exactly. Maybe it's the next painting. All right, next picture. Now we're back to Michelangelo now. Yeah. Uh, which we can talk about, but we're getting a little bit, we're, we're, we're going to have to postpone the culmination of that drama in Titian's life because we're back now uh, to the crisis that is uh, in art in, in the Renaissance and the church. And so this was, this is from the uh, wall of the Sistine Chapel. It caused huge controversy among the cardinals who were in charge of uh, life. Uh, first of all, because there's lots of nudity here, uh, uh, Federico Borromeo was not uh, in principle against nudity, but this is a chapel where you're supposed to be thinking about uh, attending at mass. And this is not conducive to raising the mind and heart to God. This is, so who's this dude here with the oar? What, what's the name of the saint? What saint is that? Got me. It's Charon. 
It's not a saint. It's from Greek mythology. This is Charon. This is the river Six and Styx. And these are the souls of the damned that are being transported to Hades, to hell. Well, why, why do we have Greek mythology in a chapel? This is the questions that are starting to be raised here. Now, given that, you have, I can't see this in detail right here, but there are lots of psychological, well, take a look at this guy. See that guy right there? With, we can't see you pointing. Oh, I'm right. sorry. So you've got Charon, and then there's a guy right uh, a little bit to uh, what would be his his uh, left. Yeah. He's holding his ears. You see him holding his ears? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make a figure. He's bending over. Look, yeah, look at the look on his face. Yeah, this, horror. This, guy, this guy is saying, oh, shit. <laughs> it's over. Yeah. It's over. I'm damned. This is the face of the damned. This is real psychological drama simply in that face. There's another one that is not, I don't think it's portrayed in here, where he's got uh, one of the guys is holding, he's got one hand over one eye, and the look on that eye is another, oh, shit moment. You know, yeah. this is it. It's over. I'm damned forever. It's per tremendous psychological power to this type of thing. But at this point, the, the Cardinals are having second thoughts about, uh, is this getting out of control? And it, it, at this moment in history, it was taken out of their hands because what we're now seeing is the Reformation uh, building, building up steam. So you had German mercenaries who were not paid uh, and when mercenaries are not paid, uh, they start looting. And that's perhaps the German mercenaries started looting Rome. They sacked Rome in 1525. And they stationed, they uh, took their horses into the Sistine Chapel. What better place to bring your horses, right? And I'm saying when they walked in there, they I guarantee you they never saw this on the walls of churches in Germany. They are shocked. They are scandalized. And they're traumatized as well. And they, they're starting to think Luther was right. This is going way too far. And then we know that uh, because there's another chapel at the Vatican where one of these German mercenaries carved the name Martin Luther on the wall. That was his comment on the art. Now, Martin Luther was not an iconoclast, but he unleashed forces that led to iconoclasm with people like Karlstadt up in Germany. So it's, they come back within two years of these guys returning to uh, Germany. Iconoclasm breaks out in southern Germany, southeastern Germany, and it starts to spread. And the church is now confronted with two options, pornography and iconoclasm. It, it's like, uh, you know, uh, it's like critical race theory and Whig history that we just went through with uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, requiem. You're confronted with two equally repugnant alternatives. Is there a mean between these things? That was the the, uh, the task of the Council of Trent. Yeah, see, the medium is now Conway West, where white lies matter. <laughs> right. Did you see that recently? Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Um, Mike, talk a little bit about, since the whole focus of this is beauty, um, Michelangelo definitely paints beautiful paintings, even if you have some naked people there. So what, give us the, your sense of the tension that's going on between portraying beauty on the one hand and trying to minimize the scandal that that beauty itself may cause because of the human body. Right. Simplest solution is carve it in stone because the stone, that mimesis in stone has a calming effect and it allows the mind to perceive the forms, the beauty of the forms without uh, concupiscence. Really? I think that, that, that is one solution, I think. Okay. Yes. Uh, if, let's so let's just the nature of stone? Is that what you're saying or what? what stone what? removes removes the sense of concupiscence that you have with when you're uh, portray when you're seeing uh, naked flesh wow i, I think i think that's one of the main reasons that sculpture is so powerful is it allows you to look at the human body in a disinterested fashion as opposed to having arousing sexual passion i see well wow. i would have never thought of that so that's very good all right next picture 
Uh, we're we're jump we're jumping way ahead. What's what's did you go? Uh, we need to do that picture of uh, of uh, the Venus and the musician to to bring this. Oh, so, that's coming. That's coming. Okay. I'm just going all right. Secret. All right. No, all right. So, so, all right. So, there, there is a Catholic solution to the dilemma of pornography versus iconoclasm, and there's a Calvinist solution, and this is the Calvinist solution to that problem. No okay. more drama. No nudity. We're going to do landscapes, <laughs> and this is Vermeer's uh, painting of Bruges. Now, this was a this is a stunning achievement. I have to say, a stunning achievement. And Michelangelo was familiar with Vermeer. And he said, I don't understand what's going on here because it looks as just, that's just the city. What's going, well, obviously the city is, there's a low cost to the city. All those buildings have order. And this comes together in a way that was unprecedented. This is not those curving, uh, distorted figures that are all, have all the Italian drama in them. This is a Calvinist understanding, a Calvinist, in a sense, purification of art by eliminating the uh, drama, eliminating classical references and eliminating the naked human form. Yeah, no, uh, we Italians have always been accused of being too dramatic, so I understand. Yes. No problem. All right, next picture. Let's keep going. Okay, next picture. There All right, go. now, here we go. We're back to Titian, and again, it's the same the same problem here. Okay, this is a very uh, sensual painting. Uh, the lady, there's that flute there that looks as if it could be the male uh, genital organ. Uh, and she's playing two flutes. Okay, you can't play two flutes. You're going to have to make up your mind here. And uh, this is part of, the again, the psychological drama that uh, Titian is talking about as, as this culture. We have to, they're looking at each other's faces. That's true. So there, there's hope here that you can, you can save this uh, relationship. You can uh, turn it into a human relationship, which is a meeting of persons uh, as the culmination of the unity of those, the union of those two bodies. So it's still hopeful. And we have the, uh, the, the angels over there falling asleep. They're all sleeping. Uh, anyway, let's go to the next picture. Okay. Again, we're well. Oh, oh. I'm just filing the sequence of your page. Numbers. No, you, no. You, well, uh, this is the culmin. Okay, I'm going to go. This yeah, is the culmination. The culmination of what we were talking about. The conflict uh, that I described uh, in Rome that the the uh, Council of Trent had to resolve. They resolved that they said there is a role of sacred art, but the Calvinists completely ignored them. And what you had was what the Dutch called the Belsenstorm, uh, Bildersturmerei is the German word for uh, uh, iconoclasm. And the uh, began with the looting, the sacking of the church, the cathedral in Antwerp, and I believe it was 1566. And this spread like wildfire north and east, and all the churches were destroyed. That was the response, like, we're not going to listen to Rome. We have our own agenda. Uh, 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 this was the Reformation in its most virulent form. And one of the men who was witness there, an eyewitness at this time, was Rubens. Um, Rubens went to Italy because everyone had to go to Italy if you wanted to learn yeah. art. And this is an early painting, and I saw this actual painting. I went to uh, the museum in Toledo, Ohio, which had a Rubens exhibit. And so it took five hours to get into the show. It was so crowded. Mm. And so I wandered around the museum and one museum is like uh, modern art, which is the non-representational things like Mondrian or Jackson Pollock, Jack the Dripper, which are basically just patterns. So they're patterns. And then that caused a reaction, which was hyper-realism, which is basically photographs that are colored in. And you have on the one hand, you have uh, form, and you, on the other hand, you have life, and they've broken completely apart. That's the story of the 20th century. The center couldn't hold. They broke apart, and they became uh, caricatures of each other. And I walked in after looking at those rooms, and I thought, this is one of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen. And I stood there transfixed. This is the triumph of the Counter-Reformation. 
It's the triumph of the Baroque. And what you have here is, yes, it's organized and it's real. There's a triangle there. There's a circle there. We're dealing with circles and triangles, but this is a real person. And when you see those things coming so effectively together, which you do not see in this photo because of that blurring there, that's what beauty is. And this is, so at this point, I'm going to say it was worth the risk. Yeah, very good point. Uh, one thing that I noticed from reading your book was that Rubens was basically the answer to Titian. Whereas Titian was going back and forth between beauty and pornography, Rubens covered up his models. That's why you see this woman in full closure, but she's absolutely beautiful. And so now we've solved the problem, basically. But clothes on the lady. Uh, yeah. There are plenty of nudes uh, in Rubens' painting. They are in the Italian style of drama. They are so damn complicated, it's impossible to figure. Like the lion hunt uh, is got these S curves. So the, the Baroque, we are so confident that we know how to organize this thing. That I defy you to come up with those that circle and triangle in this painting. Mm -hmm. uh, it, he, was, he was that confident. He was the culmination, the apotheosis of Italian art uh, now in the, in the Netherlands. Okay. Um, just a remark, another remark by Anthony, who seems to be very astute in his artistic knowledge. He says, there is an ancient Greek instrument called the aulos, aulos that is two pipes. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah, that was the, that was a, it's a reed instrument. It's like the saxophone. And that was the instrument that caused you to go into Dionysian frenzy. And that was, uh, uh, Plato said stringed instruments are better because the ratio is clearer. You know, you cut half the string and you get tone, different tones, and it's all mathematically understandable. The aulos uh, threatened to always excite the passions to the point where you can't get back again. That's, huh. that's the problem. Okay. So are you saying there's a connection between uh, Titian's painting and the aulos? Oh, I don't see any. It's a flute. It's not an aulos. Aulos is a wind instrument. Okay. All right there, Anthony. There's your answer. <laughs> okay. Next picture, please. This is Bach. Yeah. We're, uh, get, get, this is Bach. We're getting into music now. Uh, <laughs> it's too, <laughs> here. I'm getting uh, <laughs> this. Betray, I haven't finished the thought patterns that I started out with here. Yeah, well, I, see, we're still problem, we're still it? hanging. We're still hanging back. That picture of uh, Venus and the musician is a very important painting. One of those moments that really we need to dwell on. So let's yeah. let's. I, I, I don't, I don't, can, I don't can know. We, if we have I that. think I think we're I think we're if we get into music now we're we're kind of biting off more than we can chew. In, in uh, one, so we can skip the music. And let me, let's just go go to your next picture. Let me let me just okay. let's see where you're going here. Oh, Beethoven. this is Beethoven. This we're back. We're in music now. All right, so let's go to the next picture. Okay, that's yeah. the circle. That's the circle of this. That's the what the problem that Bach solved when he wrote the Well Tempered Clavier. It allowed modulation from one key to another. Uh, Beethoven played the well-tempered clavier as a boy because his father would beat him if he didn't play it. And he completely internalized this understanding, this reconciliation of the chromatic and the diatonic scales that yeah. allowed for an enormous outburst of mimesis in music. Yeah, so let's skip this and we'll come back to it in two weeks. Um, yeah, keep, uh, Hegel, you want anything about Hegel? Uh, yeah, there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole story to be told about uh, important people who were born in 1770. Uh, Hegel, Beethoven, and Wordsworth. And they have a, a crucial role to play uh, in the transition. First of all, the rise of mimesis in music reached its culmination in Beethoven. Beethoven, you said, someone said earlier on that uh, Uh, what some something about uh, someone created the individual created uh, the art for the individual. What I'm well, the point I'm trying to make here is that before Beethoven, you played in church or you played in the court, and that was it. 
uh, there was folk music, which you played in a tavern, but that was that. What Beethoven created was the concert hall. And he created the modern concert, which is basically where you get a lot of people together from all different aspects of life. He could take the entire gamut of the German population and basically have a, unite them in, in meditation on the principal issues of their age. And the, the summation of all that would be Napoleon. Napoleon and the French Revolution had a, a tremendous impact on Beethoven, Hegel, and Wordsworth. All of them born in 18, 1770. All of them were 19 years old when the French Revolution broke out. And what, what does Beethoven do? Uh, it's a new form of mimesis. We're talking about the Third Symphony, where you can portray the emotions that everyone in Europe felt when Napoleon started marching eastward, destroying the old order of things, destroying the Holy Roman Empire, the kind of ambivalence that you feel like the old order was comfortable, but it was constricting. The new order is seems liberating, but it's threatening. All of those emotions go into, and Beethoven could keep your attention, and you knew exactly what he was talking about because he was describing the feelings you had. This was a man who could articulate the emotions <coughs> of an entire continent. And that's why he became famous. And he been doing that. He created the what we call the modern concert. So you're telling us that Beethoven's Third Symphony was created because of or was a consequence of the need for to be carried by these emotions to understand what was going on in society at the time? Did he have that conscious effect on people or what? Yeah, there were people who stood up and said, yeah, it's Napoleon. That's what he's talking about. He dedicated, he put, right. he put in a piece, he dedicated, and then Prince uh, von Lupkowitz, he needed an orchestra in order to have it performed. And Prince von Lupkowitz, I met his descendant when I was in, in 1990, when I went to Munich, uh, an aristocratic family that was a great patron of the arts. Uh, he needed the orchestra. And so he just said, well, I can't really promote a revolutionary who's basically destroying Germany at the moment uh, and have an aristocrat pay for it. So he just tore it out, but everybody knew it. Everybody knew that this, this was on everyone's mind. All of that kind of trepidation and hope all mixed together and Beethoven could articulate it. And then he, he did uh, uh, the next step along the way was the Fifth Symphony, where now you're getting into something very similar to what Hegel and the German idealists were talking about, in particular Fichte, which is the, the dialectic. The dialectic, yeah, right. which is how, how, how does Logos, how does Geist, the, the German word for Logos is Vernunft, how does rationality or logos proceed through history? How does how does how does human how does a human being overcome adversity? What type of world do we live in? Is it the world of Newtonian physics, where it's all just a violent motion, and there's no divine providence? There's no there's no meaning to the movement of the planets in Newtonian physics. That was the great point of Newtonian physics. He eliminated the meaning. He transposed his own meaning onto that, a mechanical kind of meaning, turned the, um, turned the universe into a machine. Yeah. Uh, can, we, can we apprehend some type of meaning to the mo moment of human history? Hegel felt he could. I think if you want to read why I think he failed, you can read Logos Rising, the chapter there. Um, but there was a sense that we were entering a new era and that the dialectic was the, the way to deal with this. And the dialectic is, uh, you know, you're confronted with implacable nature. Yeah. You know, you're just well, stuck here. What's going to happen? And then you, what is your reaction going to be? The second movement is there's a determination that I'm going to stand up to it and I'm not going to let this thing happen to me. Yeah. Parallels uh, Fichte's uh, uh his description of this in his book called the uh, the vocation of man hegel's dialectic was an easy mode of living 
you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I mean, how much simpler can you be? Everybody liked it for that very reason, because it would explain everything uh, in a mechanical way. And uh, that's why he became so popular. I think it was more than that. I think it was the antithesis of me uh, a mechanical understanding. I think he was a reaction to Newtonian physics. I think that all of German idealism was a reaction to Newtonian physics, or more specifically, uh, Spinoza. Spinoza's materialism. It, it, you're yeah. living in a dead universe and that doesn't care about anything human. And so you've got these emotions uh, uh, that have no impact on a dead universe because basically everything is matter. Everything is matter in motion. That was the, the, the German idealist resurrected the, the uh, Christian tradition. Hegel was a, a seminarian. All of the German idealists were Lutheran seminarians. And so they're trying to come to, to some type of, how can I reconcile the gospel with the French Revolution? Yeah. How, can I, how can I reconcile that? And I think the dialectic was their, their, uh, their attempt to do that. I, I have a suggestion. Uh, why don't we why don't we take some questions? Because I, I'm not I'm not doing I'm not doing the music part justice at this point. Yeah. Yeah. But can we can we can, I see a lot of questions over there on the side. Why don't we spend some time answering the questions? Yeah. OK, that'll be good. So let me go up to the top here and see a lot of the questions that came in weren't dealing with our topic tonight, but there were some. So. Um, Uh, and we're just going to deal with your book. We're not going to deal with theological topics. Yeah. Uh, let me see if there is any here. This is, there's a question here. Do you think the invention of microscopes and other photographical equipment brought forth abstract modern art? And do you see any redeeming qualities in essence only art like this? That's a good question. Uh, if you get to the part of uh, 19th century in France, I think, one of the crucial uh, influences that created uh, Impressionism was the camera. This caused a crisis in mimesis because now you had a machine that could imitate nature, <clears throat> or it seemed that way. And I'm saying you can't. That's not a, a photographic reproduction is not imitation of nature. <clears throat> now, if, if any of you subscribe to Culture Wars magazine, uh, you'll know that I wrote an article about spending a week in Brad Pitt's bachelor pad in Carmel, California. It wasn't, he, he moved in uh, right after I'd left. Uh, and, and beautiful house. And there is a picture of me and my wife standing uh, on the, the, uh, pa uh, the patio overlooking the Pacific Ocean in the background. The sun is going down and it's, if ever, ever a photograph that was a work of art, this is the photograph because the lady who took it just had a set a sense of the exact right moment. You know, the golden moment when the sun goes down and it illuminates everything. It unified the picture. Uh, that's the exception. Photography um, and what you're talking about there is it, it's already been organized. So you've got a beautiful house on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It's a, a classic example of uh, grace perfecting nature or art perfecting nature. So you've got that logos there and it's just a question of pressing the button at the right time. Okay. So, and, and we're going to cover a lot of photography, which is toward the end of your book. Right. Um, in our next session. So we'll deal with that then. Here's another question for you, Mike. Is fine art relevant today? If not, what art impacts culture the most? Yeah. Fine art is always relevant. Because you're always the the world is always changing, and you always have some uh, you need of some type of vision to organize the world that we live in, and I would say that uh, uh, it never died in Italy. It never died. Uh, uh, they've always ke kept this tradition, but what happened over the course of the 20th century is that the the Jewish dealers took over the art world, yeah. and so by 1947 you had. Uh, a Jewish operation. The first Jewish operation was known as Cubism. It was a guy by the name of Conviler who cre basically created a movement and got Picasso and Brock to do these things that nobody, uh, nobody can figure out. Uh, and that's good for the dealer. 
because yeah. the dealer gets power here. The culmination of that was uh, Castelli, uh, another Jewish art dealer this time. He's the guy who created Andy Warhol. Uh, but in the meantime, you had abstract expressionism. Yeah, and Picasso said, what would, what would I do without Kahnweiler, right? Right, <laughs> yeah. right. So what you're seeing is the dealer. So if, if you're moving constantly away from mimesis and you're coming up with fads, like someone just mentioned Dadaism, there are all these isms, which are basically Jewish creations, which is a form of insider trading. So you look at it and say, I can't, I can't make heads or tails of this damn thing. I don't even know whether it's hanging right side up or upside down. And the dealer says, that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. If you buy this, it will increase in value by this amount and you'll, you'll make money off of it. And so they turned it into insider trading. Yeah. Which is basically, uh, it's true. Anything, if it's stock in a company, if you get enough, if it's Bitcoin, if you get enough people to buy it, the price will go up and you're, you're, you'll get a return on your investment. Yeah. It's not art and it's not mimesis. But, um, so so the, the, the very moment, the triumph of abstract expressionism post-World War II New York, 1947, Pietro Anagoni, one of the great uh, port uh, painters in the tradition of Italian art in the 20th century, holds a show and nobody shows up. <laughs> not, you didn't one person, a not one person showed up that one of the great I would say I'm going to go out on them the greatest portrait painter of the 20th century and if you don't believe me Google uh, Pietro Anagoni Queen Elizabeth I think that's one of the greatest portraits of the 20th century once the English aristocracy caught on he started making money he did covers for Time Magazine but at that moment um, nobody showed up yeah, because it was it, it, the fads had taken over and abstract expressionism was the fad at that particular moment. Yeah. And he didn't realize he needed a promoter and a big one. That's right. That's right. Okay. There, somebody had a good question here. Um, uh, I lost it. Let me go down to the bottom then. Uh, and by the way, folks, um, when we do our second show, uh, which I think is going to be the most interesting because we're going to get into the modern period where uh, everything that's been happening for the last hundred years is going to make sense to you now, because Mike's going to explain it to us in a way that only Mike can. Uh, but stay tuned for two weeks from now for, for our next show, because what you're seeing tonight is just a preparation for all that. So, all right. Um, so many modern artists are actually Jewish, but change their names like Mark Chagall. Do you know anything about Mark Chagall, Mike? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you think that's art, I mean, if you think that's some, in some sense comparable to any of the pictures uh, we have uh, seen tonight, well, I, I have to disagree with you. Yeah. I think Mark Chagall is a famous artist because he's Jewish. Yeah. And they, 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 Israel Shamir has said this. He wrote a, a piece on art. And he said, no group in the world is less qualified to uh, take control of the art world than the Jews. They have no, no, we talked about that Muslim lady had no background whatsoever to appreciate this. Well, the Jews were in the same type of situation. Yeah. And what they did, in a sense, they don't do art. They do. They 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 become uh, art dealers. They they're involved in the money end of art, and other uh, parts of it are uh, they get involved in museums, and so they subsidize uh, things like piss Christ. Why is that art? It's art yeah. because some Jew said it was, and Jews love blasphemy and pornography. Yeah, that's the type of takeover that took place in the 20th century. It wasn't that they had a whole bunch of Jewish artists. There aren't many Jewish artists. They don't want to take the time. Do you know what is Jewish? Photography. Yes. And that was in the New York Times. The article in the New York Times said, why is it that all photographers are Jews? Why are Jews and photographers? Well, I'll tell you why. Because all you have to do is press a button. And yeah. you don't have to worry about, you know, paying. How long did it take you before that you could do that? Yeah. And suddenly it's an earring. That's yeah. what Rubens did. If you look closely at that lady's ear, the Spinola Doria's ear, it's a, it's like a, a, a comma. It's an inverted comma. But when you step back, hey, it's an earring. How did he do that? That's magic. Well, the Jew doesn't want to waste his time trying to do learn all that type of stuff. He's in it for the for the money. And so as a result, uh, art declined. Yeah. 
And uh, when we do our next show, uh, we're going to cover one of the more famous photographers, uh, Robert Maplethorpe, which right. is, uh, Mike covers a lot in the latter part of the book. Uh, someone writes here, Mark Chagall's real name is Al Goldstein. Is that true? That's a joke. That's a joke. Oh, that's a joke. Al okay. Goldstein was the famous <laughs> pornographer. He was the editor of Screw oh, Magazine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. No, Chagall did not do pornography, but he did. It's very primitive stuff. It's like the, you know, Fiddler on the Roof, shtetl type stuff. And it it's not organized. We were way beyond this. And now there's this kind of primitivism that's rearing its head in uh, in 20th century. And I'm telling you, he's a famous artist because he's Jewish. Yeah. That's simple. Yeah. And also, um, um, one person here is mentioning the Central Intelligence Agency, which you talk a lot about in the latter part of the book and which we'll cover two weeks from now. But he says the Central Intelligence Agency used American modern art, including the works of such artists as Jackson Pollock, Robert Motherwell, William de Kooning, and Mark Rothko as a weapon in the Cold War. And Mike covers those four people there in depth. So we're going to get a full synopsis of that when he comes back. You yeah. want to say anything about that now, Mike? Yeah, I mean, the CIA got involved in the cold, cultural Cold War. Uh, they created a front group called the Congress of Cultural Freedom, which was uh, uh, to be uh, an antidote to basically the Soviet uh, Soviet culture at the time. So the, a big showdown took place in New York. The communists were bold. They, they felt that they had superior art to the West. They thought the Western art is decadent. And to be honest with you, I think they were right. And they had the best composers in the world right now. The best composers in the world at that time, as of, let's say, 1950, 1949, they were all Russian. And the, the, uh, the, the, the Jews were promoting uh, Schoenberg, which is absolutely unlistenable. Uh, and uh, they were losing the battle. And so they had to come up with something where we look superior. And this was Jack the Dripper which was basically, it was Soviet, it was the opposite of Soviet realism, you know, yeah. socialist realism, which yeah. was, you know, that, that, that chick with the big biceps, yeah. you know what I mean? Who's got yeah. a wrench in one hand and, yeah, yeah. okay, uh, all right, Rosie, that's a little Rosie bit. Rosie the different. Riveter. Yeah, that was Rosie the Riveter, which I think was influenced by Soviet uh, propaganda. Hmm. Uh, there are, I, uh, I, when we, do you remember when we drove into uh, uh, St. Petersburg? We're coming down the road and then we have to, there's a building right in front of us. You got to make, we had to make a left-hand turn. And right in front of that building was a statue of Lenin. It was still there. Thank God. Thank God they didn't tear that statue down. It was a brilliant statue. Absolutely brilliant statue. You, all of the dy dynamism of that early communism is this man coming towards you, kind of striding towards you. His coat is flapping in the wind. It was brilliant. It was yeah. brilliant. Thank God for, Socialist realism, because it kept the tradition of mimesis alive. Huh. No, I wouldn't think that was mimesis, but if you say so, that's fine. Yeah. I have pe People would ask me, why are you always talking about your nieces? <laughs> okay. Um, somebody asked here, I don't have it in front of me, and he says, what do you think of Vincent Van Gogh? Uh, I, I have... <laughs> I Mike have to say, I have to, I have to say, this was a powerful, for, a powerful force, uh, a man who, who, who saw things differently, uh, came out of that tradition. You know, I, 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 this is my medic. This is my medic in a way that is, it is. I would have to say, at that time, it's my medic in a way that is a reaction to the camera, and the camera is mechanical, and so there's a little bit more of the person. It's it's becoming more subjective, I think, in reaction to the camera, which is just a kind of objective mechanistic uh, reproduction. This is there's a lot of feeling in in a lot of drama, a lot of feeling uh, projected into that emotional dynamism projected into the landscape, the starry night, that type of thing. Yeah, uh, the camera was invented. I think it was 1823. And the Impressionists came along after that. Do you think the Impressionism was a reaction to the camera? I do. I do. I think that that, that remember that picture of that 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 lady uh, uh, Psyche uh, that we did the French version with that beautiful butt of hers 
there that is the focal point of the whole thing. That was uh, the salon type of painting that was going on at the time. It was mimetic, but it was kind of, you're, you're copying other works of art as opposed to going to nature in the way that uh, Cezanne uh, was doing at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, coming up with a, a take on nature that nobody had done before. I think it was, it was too subjective for my taste. That's the problem, I think, with that point is that it became too uh, certainly so subjective that it became distorted uh with uh picasso who was yeah well he's the next step beyond Cezanne. Part. yeah do you think it was inevitable to have a picasso after suzanne nothing uh, is inevitable nothing is enough that picasso is a function of his own disordered desires yeah and i go into that in, in great detail in in the book uh okay. like what so when when uh, Picasso fell in love with a woman, it was realistic because realistic because you're interested in the object. That's why you're in love with the lady. You know, you're fascinated by this object, this person, this other person. It's something other than you. And then he gets disgusted. This the 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 sexual disgust rears its ugly head, and at that point he's talking about himself. And so that's where you get these distortions. Look at the two pictures. Of, there are two pictures of Dora Maar, one of his mistresses. And you can see in the book, you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you have an illicit relationship. Yeah, the hatred. There's a kind of hatred that gets projected onto the object in the yeah. same way that your love or lust got projected onto the object. Yeah, he, the just, he just had the bad habit of putting those feelings in his, into his paintings. That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, somebody else asks, what would be a good example of a good use of mimesis in the modern era? It seems like in pop culture, we also have this false dichotomy of pornography versus iconoclasm. Yeah, I, I've already given you an example. Pietro Anagoni is running exactly parallel to the uh, uh, um, abstract expressionism. There's another guy, the, the, uh, I forget, his name uh, escapes me, uh, a contemporary right now who did the portrait of St. Simon of Trent, which enraged the Jews, absolutely enraged the Jews. But it's it's serious. It's serious, serious work of art, first of all, because of its, its realism, because this man has talent. He can actually portray nature. But he's also dealing with, uh, has this daring, like, I'm going to deal with the absolute taboo, most taboo topic I can talk about which is no longer sex. It's, it's the Jews and their control of our culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's daring. And that's why uh, I think I, it never died in Italy. It never died. Mm. All right. Two more questions. And then we're going to have to call it a night. Uh, one is, um, what is what's your opinion of Tom Wolfe's The Painted Word? Are you familiar with that, Mike? No. Okay. I'm familiar with Bau, uh, Bauhaus to Our House, uh, but no, I'm not familiar enough to have an opinion. Okay. All right. Um, next question. I think we already addressed this, but let's just clarify uh, what we said. He asks, is the nudity of the Sistine Chapel a sign of Michelangelo's homosexuality, and should the figures now be covered up? Yes. We need to paint boxer shorts. <laughs> Boxer shorts on the no. I think that I think that uh, I told you I told you what I think about uh, the uh, David. I think yeah. he was artist enough to portray the beauty out there without. Uh, uh, I think I I I don't see I don't see homosexuality in those paintings. Okay. I see a kind of exuberance. I think that uh, uh, maybe inappropriate. For a chapel, which is what many of the, the, the many of those uh, cardinals felt at the time, but uh, no, I don't see it. Okay, I, I so don't see it. Mike, would you do? You, have you ever read anything that even suggests Michelangelo was homosexual? No, it's just one of those tropes that uh, keeps okay. coming up. I don't know whether he was or he wasn't. Okay, all right. Um, maybe we have time for one more here. Um, well, we already did the microscope one. Yeah, I think we got them all, unless there's some down at the bottom here. Um, ba, 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 ba. How do you feel about Gary Larson? Do you know Gary Larson? You mean the cartoonist? I guess so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's funny. Funny stuff. Is he still doing cartoons? I don't know, but it was funny stuff. 
Okay. Now he's just political. You wouldn't say he has any philosophical. Uh, I I don't I I don't think he's political at all. It's just one of these no. quirky things where, I don't know. I guess remember there's there's a frog. Uh, you know, he shoots out his tongue and he catches an airplane instead of a fly, and he's kind of sucked up there. It's just cra- you know, kind of quirky stuff that just makes you laugh. And that's okay. That. Here's another question for you. What do you think of graphical design? Is there a difference between that and art? I have been told that works such as the painting press are graphical design rather than art. Painting press? How, painting? What did he say? Printing press, such as printing the printing press, press are graphical design rather than printing art. Press, the printing press is an instrument. Uh, if, if you're talking about, there are now computer computer designed art, artificial intelligence art. You can look it up. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's very, it's like your, uh, do you have Siri on your cell phone? You know, yeah. Siri mm-hmm. will tell you what road to take based on an algorithm, uh, based on the speed of the traffic. She's not making decisions. The decisions have already been made. So mm-hmm. if it shows up red, she'll tell you to go someplace else. That's pretty much, you cannot have art without a mind. Uh, and so what you're doing with this artificial intelligence art is basically the mind is receding into the background where you're not dealing with it. Basically, you will take pictures of sunsets. Everybody thinks sunsets are beautiful. So you take a lot of pictures of sunsets and then you categorize them as beautiful. You, you get the computer will then go through and pick out these things and put them together. And you're 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 all pre- playing on the natural beauty of a sunset, which is God created. You're not creating beauty. You're just you're just taking a picture of something that God created, mixing it with other pictures of things that people conventionally call beautiful, and then you come up with something that is like a mishmash of beautiful images that don't hang together at all. Yeah, that's the problem because you can only have art if you have a mind. A camera right. is not a mind. Very good. Okay, so we're going to have to cut it off here. Mike, um, let's uh, just spend a minute here telling people how they can get your book, how much it costs, and anything else you want to say along those yeah, lines. Yeah, you can go go to culturewars.com. Do not go to Google. Do not go to these search engines. Go directly to culturewars.com or fidelitypress.org. The book is available there. We have copies here. We can send them out. You'll get them within two days of of uh, of placing your order. Okay, great, Mike. Uh, so can you give me um, a promise that you'll be here in two weeks to finish this whole now, thing? Now, this, what is uh, Wednesday? Wednesday is... Uh, Wednesday is, uh, that would be the 19th. I will not be back. I'm, I'm, I'll be coming back from my uh, book tour in the West, and I will not be back on the 19th. I will right. be back on the 20th. Can we do okay. it on the 20th? Uh, that would be the 26th. 26th. Okay, I think we're going to have to postpone it then because I I can't – I'm going to be on the road. Okay. It's, not even, it's not even that I'm going to be at a place where I'll be sitting down. I'll, I'll be yeah. literally on the road on that day. All right, so we'll send you a note about the 26th when you get back and look forward to having you then. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. And anybody has any questions, of course, they can contact Michael at Culture Wars. and Uh, The email address, jones at culturewars.com, if you want to write to me. Jones at culturewars.com. Great. Okay, Mike, thank you so much for coming. We'll see you in three weeks. Take care. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. My pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye.